there's so much about Kate's story that's relevant and kind of timeless about, you know, being a woman and uh, predominantly men's space and being industrious and taking care of yourself and being independent and the choices that we have to make um, to survive and not just survive, but to thrive. Welcome to the Whiskey Lifestyles Women in Whiskey series. I am your host, Rashawn Hall. Thank you guys for tuning in. This episode, we have a uh, really interesting guest who is going to talk to us about a new-ish brand. Been around for a year or two. Uh, hopefully, I did not get that incorrect. Uh, so let's welcome in the CEO of Big Nose Kate Whiskey, Melissa Heim. Mel, thank you for joining us this week. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, you know, let's, let's start at the beginning. Who is Big Nose Kate and why are people so mean to her? Why are people what? <laughs> so mean to her. You're so mean. All her Big Nose Kate. People are cruel. Uh, yeah, Big Nose Kate is, is a real person. And, uh, you know, most know Kate as Doc Holliday's girlfriend. Um, and most people do know Doc Holliday. And I, being you know, really drawn to great stories. And I was an English major. I actually read a, a book called According to Kate, and it's as close to a biopic as you can get. She didn't give many interviews. And I learned about this person's story. And I'd actually never even connected the dots that Kate was Doc Holliday's girlfriend. And then I went back and watched Tombstone and was like, ah, oh, right, there she is. Um, but what I discovered was this really rich, beautiful, complicated uh, full of tension story of this this real human who, you know, romped around the Wild West during the same times as all these very famous and infamous cowboys. Um, and I was pretty disappointed, though not shocked, to discover that her story had sort of been scrubbed out of history, um, namely because Wyatt Earp did not care for her. Um, and so she was sort of reduced down to this this very singular being and you know when i read the book uh i was obsessed there's so much about kate's story that's relevant and kind of timeless about you know being a woman and uh, predominantly men's space and being industrious and taking care of yourself and being independent and the choices that we have to make um to survive and not just survive but to thrive so so kate uh was a hungarian immigrant born maria magdolna isabella Horny. And when she came to the States, uh, she was orphaned within the first two years when her parents passed away. So how do we have this like very affluent European child, uh, you know, in a very short amount of time end up rubbing, you know, bucking horns and rubbing elbows with some of the wildest men in American history. Um, and that was just too good of a story to pass up. And my partners and I knew we had to tell this story and, uh, I thought I was going to be a writer when I was going to school, but I didn't have the discipline to write. <laughs> so my medium is making whiskey. And so from this story, uh, that was the catalyst for us to come together and build this brand and uh, build this liquid around this person. Cool. Awesome. Well, as a former writer, you got your bullet. So, and you're <laughs> still telling stories through your liquid. Uh, yes. So tell us a little bit about the the Big Nose Kate whiskey brand. It, it is an American whiskey Tell us a little bit more about kind of what the ethos of uh, the spirit itself is. Sure. The spirit's quite unconventional and that's intentional um, because Kate was quite intentional. Well, quite unconventional, pardon me. Um, so there's also a lot of tension in the whiskey. Um, when designing, you know, a, a liquid profile around someone's personality, it really allows me as a blender and distiller to flex some of my creative muscle. And I really wanted to bring the art of blending forward because in the 16 years I've been making spirits, uh, the the first third is really focused on the, the art and science of distillation. And then, you know, the latter half of my career has been really focused around blending. And I've been blending whiskey for a long time. So, you know, it, it really was like, what isn't this whiskey? And so when I started, you know, again, digging into Kate's story and trying to figure out what liquids to use, um, as this was going to be blended, so I'm sourcing whiskeys that are already finished, it became very clear what it wasn't, and this wasn't bourbon. Um, and I think, you know, that in a sea of bourbon, it's really great to be different. And Kate's different. So, again, just just kind of taking these small little nuances and building 
Um, the liquid story was very fun. So what came of that was a very unconventional blend of American single malt whiskey and rye whiskey. And um, it's really turned out beautifully. So the joy in the art of blending is taking these sort of chaotic components and creating harmony out of them. And I'm really pleased with what we did because on a very generic baseline, if we were, you know, to describe Kate in a couple of adjectives, like, yeah, spicy, rowdy, you know, sort of in your face would be a good descriptor. And that's what rye grain sort of is on the palate. And then American single malt. What's more American than American single malt? Well, I think it's more American than bourbon. And this is quite the American tale, um, but also with her European roots. Um, it didn't make any sense to me to use corn. Um, I didn't, you know, I wanted there to be sweet undercurrents because there was, you know, Kate did have a sweeter side, but it wasn't corn sweet. Um, so figuring that out uh, pretty early on and in, in then, you know, I... The, 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 pardon me, reel back. The deduction from all of these pieces uh, is how we developed the blend of 53% rye and 47% American single malt. Okay. Uh, and it's interesting you note, uh, you said your 16 year career. So you are, you're based in Portland, Oregon. You've been, so you've been distilling and blending for 16 years west of the Mississippi, which even east of Mississippi, women bl distilling is, 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 you know, not as prevalent as one might assume, but West, I would think is, is even less than how did you Mel get into, get into the space and what kind of, what kind of brought you to be still in blending? Well, it is interesting because unlike being on the, on the East side of the Mississippi, so in Kentucky and bourbon country, um, where there's a lot of history and not just a lot of history, but a lot of present day, uh, commercial, pardon me, a lot of present day commercialization of whiskey and distilled spirits. We just didn't have that out in the West. Um, you know, we're, I sometimes feel like I'm on an Island out here less now, but when I started definitely, um, you know, what we had in the West was like a smattering of craft distilleries. So we had no legacy producers out here and everybody was a new craftsman and new to the scene. So born and raised in Portland, Oregon, which is the Mecca of craft beer, um, we have beautiful wine country here, and there's a reason why beverages do well here, and people are drawn here because of the agriculture and because of the water. And so we actually had a high concentration of craft, craft distilleries in the early aughts, um, more so than than other states, and in the even higher concentration were located in Portland. Um, and so I, being the English major with no real grand plans on the horizon, got a job at a brewery and that brewery happened to have a small craft distillery uh, attached to it, a little satellite distillery. Now I was on the brink of losing that job. I'm pretty sure because I spent more time in the distillery asking questions and being very nosy. Uh, and luck would have it that the distiller was leaving to go to law school. And he said, you know, I need to, I need a replacement. And I think you should do it because you have a good palate and you're obviously curious um, and I could train you. And I was like, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, and so I passed and he just kept offering. He said, it's, I will train you what to do. Like the worst thing that's going to happen is that you don't like it. Um, you know, when we go through the training and, and you can obviously just do something else. So I reluctantly agreed. And that was in 2008. And uh, after six weeks, he was gone and I was running operations of the distillery. So not exactly a straight line path into the industry. Um, I was very fortunate to be at the right place, right time kind of circumstance. Um, but he was correct in noticing that and nurturing that in me. I was very curious as soon as I started learning about it and he was describing what was happening up there. I mean, I, it clicked something in my brain that didn't happen in high school chem. Like I was engaged um, in a way that I hadn't been engaged in STEM before. So that was the beginning of a very long uh, kind of winding journey to where we are today. Okay. And what, uh, what kept obviously the, 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 the love of the juice, I would think to some extent, and also the, the process, what kept you in that long journey to getting to from there to big nose Kate? Yeah. Uh, I think just opportunity and expansion, you know, there's no, 
mastering anything about distilling or blending is a it's a lifetime achievement. Um, and so the more I learned, the more I realized I didn't know. And that's what kept the drive going is that we started with rum up in that distillery, just a small Portland distillery making rum. And, you know, I didn't know much about rum. What I knew about rum is what I saw in TV ads. And, you know, rum is for punch. It just had this very um, limited exposure to actually what the spirits are. So every year, every time we tried something new and I learned something new, I mean, it just kept, the curiosity just kept building. And then the opportunities grew, you know, basically in synchronicity. So the more I learned, the more distilleries were opening and the scene was, you know, becoming less NASA and more robust. And uh, there was a huge focus on craft distilling, you know, within five years of that time. So, again, I think I entered just circumstantially at the right place at the right time. And I love what I do. And I'm always learning things. So it keeps me engaged. And as a uh, as a craft distiller, or as, as you were getting into this craft distilling space, what was your interest or exposure to spirits prior to that where you were you were you know obviously started in a brewery were you into spirits were you were you more of a beer person how did how did your palate as a consumer evolve in that time uh it it evolved exponentially i would say my introduction to spirits was that of a college student um i started in this you know industry when i was 24 so you know, very limited uh, exposure to fine spirits or good spirits or even responsibly using spirits. Um, but beer, I, my passion was in beer. I mean, I still love beer. Uh, and I know the market is struggling a little bit, but, um, you know, you throw a rock around here and hit an excellent brewery. So it did start in beer. And I just had this like love of beer and brewers um, and breweries. And I grew up, you know, just above the hill uh, from Woodmer Brewery. And so you know, my whole childhood, you could smell like, you know, the mash cooking. It just smelled awesome all the time. So it was, it was always around. And, um, so that's where it started now jumping over into the spirit space and, and not making that direct leap from beer to whiskey was interesting. So to go into rum was my first introduction of, you know, let's talk about esters. Let's talk about why this rum has flavor. And mind you, this is the first time I had tried rum that had flavor that wasn't an added flavor. I mean, these are just esters from the still and kind of breaking down the science. So I was very lucky that my mentor kind of understood the way that I thought and understood the way that I experienced things and actually trained me backwards. Um, not a very orthodox way to learn how to, how to distill or how to blend or even how to taste. You know, we started with the final product and it was as simple as like, well, what do you taste? And I didn't have the huge vocabulary for it, but, you know, I could with some guidance, you know, say is this, it's a little floral, it's a little flowery. And then we would try other spirits, you know, off the clock, just like, again, expanding education. And what do you taste? What are you tasting? And it really started like that. It started with words and I was able to start identifying things. And then he really took me through the process backwards, like how we got to that. And that was super helpful for me. And, and, um, because otherwise, like I said, in high school chemistry, if they had said, this ethanol is vodka, bling, I might have been listening. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So in, in that uh, in that course of your, the span of your career, uh, when did you realize that distilling, you know, that this was, this was a career path. This was not just a, I don't know, momentary blip. This is not just a, oh, a, a passion and that I'm going to, you know, follow. When did you think this is a thing that I could do for a living? Yeah, I think, you know, I was very unsure for a long time. Um, there weren't a lot of, like I said, a lot of distilleries and what was around, you know, typically the founder was the distiller. Um, this is the craft space. So it was very undercapitalized, um, most of these craft distillers. And, you know, you can just walk through the door and say, I want to distill or make your products. They're like, yeah, that's what we do. Um, and so I knew that I had a good with the position that I had. Um, but I did, I did think it was a blip. Um, the, the stress, I was stressed a lot, uh, and it put a lot of pressure on myself, but there was some external pressure too, you know, working for another business. And I, you know, there were many times in my career where I didn't think I had the chops to do it. 
and took breaks, you know, because I had to. Um, and again, just for opportunity. So, you know, it's been cyclical. Uh, even during the pandemic, I lost my job of eight and a half years. And I didn't think that I would have to job search, uh, which, you know, nobody does. A lot of people were in the same position. Um external forces, you know, and I, my hand was forced and I said, do I want to continue? I'll likely have to relocate. Um, do I start my own business or do I, you know, it's a very niche thing to make spirits. And I was like, what other transferable skills do I have? Like, what are my soft skills? Do I have soft skills or am I just good at making, you know, spirits? And luckily I didn't have to, you know, ruminate on that too long. Um, when I was, contacted by my now partners who were looking for a partner to start a, a distillery. So as luck would have it, I was lured back in. So tell me a little bit about that. I didn't, so that's interesting. I did not know that this came as a result of people reaching out to you. Tell me a little bit about that initial outreach and how you all got from that initial conversation to being nose case. Yeah. So I have two other founders and um, these guys are awesome and we were all in the exact same position in our lives so for instance my partner kevin burke was the former global head of innovation at beam suntory not a small gig by any means but um, his time had like run its course there and he was looking to do something interesting and he had a friend named paul earl who's our third partner who's the uh, professor of entrepreneurship and innovation at the Kellogg School of Business. Again, no small gig. Um, and they are very progressive in the way they think about brands. Um, and they had it in the back of their minds for a long time that, you know, it's time to disrupt kind of this old boys club back bar. Mind you, they're not alone in this. Every woman in this field feels the same way. Uh, so I received an email from a colleague you probably know her, um, Rebecca Harris from Catoctin Creek, which said, I received this kind of like short deck, just explaining this very broad stroke business idea, uh, to create a whiskey for, of a female protagonist. Like this wasn't plugged in with details. And she goes, I've been sitting on it because I didn't know anyone who could credibly do it. But now that you are free and have no job of your own, um, why don't you take a look? And so because of my peers kind of stepping in and, and thinking of me, she shot that over and I was like, well, that's interesting. Um, you know, the side asterisks here, a little postscript is I had a newborn child at the same time as well. And so starting my journey as an entrepreneur while having a newborn just did not seem feasible or responsible. Um, but I reached out to Kevin and Paul and, you know, we kind of talked through the logistics of what this partnership would look like. What could we do? What are the possibilities? How would we fund? And the world, you know, was standing still. And we thought there's probably not going to be an opportunity like this again. And, you know, I confessed to them. I said, you're about two years ahead of me. I think if I had been, um, you know, if I had had this opportunity in two years where I'd lost my job or the world was standing still, I would start a brand like this, but you've done the work. So that's great. <laughs> I'm here to help. Um, so they know how to position brands, how to build brands. You know, they understand the market because they're very entrenched in the CPG space. And um, I know how to make whiskey. So, you know, Captain Planet, our powers combined, uh, we make a pretty awesome team and we launched this product. Oh, let's see back up a little bit. We incorporated in August of 2020. We had a business name and we commercialized and had our first bottles on the shelf at the end of 2021. Wow. Yeah. That is, that is a quick turnaround, but it, as, as you said, you know, you let Captain, I, I love the Captain Planet reference. Yeah. That's a, three very different skill sets all coming together. Uh, and then, you know, on top of that, you then have some other partners who came in and, and had their own unique POV and I'll, I'll let you explain what that means. Uh, but what did that, you know, what did that additional partnership mean for this brand? Yeah. So to fill people, people in, uh, to be less coy, we do have two partners, uh, you know, our ding dongs don't 
don't play that. <laughs> our uh, our partners that they're a list celebrity. So Melissa McCarthy and her husband Ben Falcone invested in our company um, when we were a year old, which is pretty wild in itself. Um, but my partners and I have the same philosophy with brands and building successful brands and you know building successful businesses is that. You cannot put all your eggs in one basket and rely on this X factor. And so, you know, celebrity brands are a dime a dozen. They're usually in the clear spirits. There's a lot in brown spirits and it's a lot of country singers making, you know, their whiskey brands partnerships. But we didn't want that because we know we have good liquid. Like we've actually built something and I'm going to say these three words over and over though, that was unconventional, credible and accessible. And we didn't believe we needed um, the lift from celebrities. So we were happy to take their money during our seed round as investors. And then we kept them as silent partners for a year. So again, it was very important to us to get our proof of concept, let the liquid speak for itself, get consumer acceptance, um, get consumer feedback. You know, this is all part of the kind of experiment phase where you're just gathering data and intel about your product out in the market. And then, you know, the sensible business people take that and they evolve, you know, change anything that needs to be changed, um, improve where we need to improve or expand on things that are going well. Um, and then you go out and expand. And so Melissa and Ben were gracious enough to, again, come in at our seed round as investors. And now we, you know, have them as an extension of our marketing arm and, you know, they can they pop out the market sometimes, kind of surprise and delight. They pop up on our Instagram feed. Sometimes we know about it. Sometimes we don't. <laughs> That's kind of what's cool about it is that they're true partners. They just want to see us succeed. And this is not their brand. And we jokingly refer to them as the seventh most interesting thing about this product. Uh -huh. Yeah, and they know their place. Uh, but it, it, but it is. It's it's always nice to have access and just partners that believe in you. So again, just because these the celebrities came in and invested in us like we were we still have the option to say yes or no but uh, when it comes to partners they are i couldn't think of better partners they're authentic they're hilarious they wear their hearts on their sleeves they you know they represent who they truly are so what you see is what you get with them and i really like that um and you know there's a lot about melissa's story in her industry that resonates with me in my history in this industry, you know, like how long it takes to hit your stride, kind of coming in male dominated space. And, um, yeah, we just click on a lot of levels. So, so we do have them kind of in our back pocket and, mm -hmm. uh, and leverage, you know, their voices whenever we can, whenever it makes sense. But, um, you know, so far we're just building this thing organically. No, and that, and that's awesome. Given again, as the, the plethora of celebrity brands that are out there, that it's you know, Reed knows Kate is still the focal point of this brand, which is which is amazing. Um, so you know, you you mentioned being a uh, being a mother, starting this brand at the same time, being a new mother. How do you achieve? And it's a, it's a question we've asked, and unfortunately, it's, I feel like it's a question everyone should be asked, but like more often not, women are asked this. How do you achieve that balance? How do you figure out what is the work-life balance in an industry that is all, you know, a, a lot of times bars, night, you know, nightlife, et cetera. How do you achieve that balance for, for, for yourself? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, and I would say balance isn't necessarily like a 50, 50, like sometimes it's 70, 30, but then, you know, I need to make sure that in the near future it's 30, 70, it goes the other way. Um, and so for me, I've been lucky. I just, I have, you know, it's partnership in my relationship with my wife and that's how we get things done. I mean, there's no, like I work eight hours and I'm with my kids eight hours. Everything I do is for them. Now I have two. I don't know what I was thinking. Why not? Uh, but one, two, who cares at this point? So it's a joke. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it's the work is very demanding and it's just about communication for us. And I'll have to, you know, spend more focus on work. I just got home yesterday from being on the road for six days. And, you know, that was hard on me. It was hard on the kids. You know, we're FaceTiming and um, just checking in, you know, throughout the day and 
we miss each other. And, you know, I'm like, oh, my wife, like dealing with <laughs> two little kids under four. Um, but then when I come back, I'm, you know, I make a very conscious choice to put them first again. Um, and so, yeah, it's never striking that perfect balance, but it is maintaining the balance over, the, you know, the course of a long period of time. Yeah. It did make things tricky at the beginning. <laughs> Okay. I, I don't have kids and I am a man. So uh, I, I, I won't say I totally, I see, I have no, no additional thought. I'm sure. Uh, well, thank you for asking. Yes. Yeah. No, it, well, it, I ran it, it, it is that thing. Right? It's, it's, uh, it's funny. It's having, uh, all of my guy friends all have daughters. And then that, that was the thing with me was like, oh, and much of a guy, like now, yeah, that, that your purview pivots and I was raised by women. So yeah. I, I am often thinking about, oh, the world, yes, obviously the world is conditioned to think in a certain way, but like, yeah, that, why, and yes, to your point, why does everyone else have to have balance? Like, yeah, we all should have balance. We all should be able to turn it off and turn it on and be able to work and then be able to be partners and involved in our family's lives, et cetera. Um, so uh, to completely shift tack a little bit, uh, we are re- we're going to get a little, we just, you know, have a light, a couple of lighthearted questions to end the interview. Um, my first question is, what do you think Kate would think of the whiskey? I think Kate would think it was awesome. Kind of about it. Yeah. Okay. No, we, we do think about that. Uh, again, like the number one word, if I had a whiteboard, if we all shared an office, which we don't, okay, my computer, um, it would say intention. You know, what we do is intentional. And so I would hope that she would see the amount of effort that went into this and appreciate that that so much passion and love and work was poured into her and telling her story and getting the liquid right, you know, as much as we can. I mean, mind you, the whiskey that she drank in Tombstone was swill. So hopefully she thinks this is an upgrade. Um, but no, we do think that. I think she would think it was awesome because, you know, she knew what her worth was. And a little side note about that, the reason there's no books about Kate or movie series or anything like that is she refused to sell her story. She gave one interview in her whole life um, in the 1930s. So she's in her 80s at this point. And, you know, as soon as people came to get her story, they started asking about Doc. Everybody just wanted to get closer to Doc and she would just shut him down and send him out and say, get out. Like, I'll tell you my story. Um, and And no one ever offered to hear her story. So I would like to think that she would um, be happy about this. Okay. And then I guess lastly, since you, uh, I was going to ask a different question, I'm going to pivot. Since you said that, uh, and you're hot and having Hollywood connections, do the, is there a world in which big nose Kate ever gets her big screen, silver screen debut and, and people truly get to know her story? Or is that, is that a thought? Oh, they wish, not at, not asking you to yeah. break any confidentiality, but yeah. <laughs> just hold up an NDA. Um, <laughs> no, it's, you know, we're just at the beginning. We're entering our third year. So you were correct. We were two years old. We're just entering our third year. Um, this is hopefully just one way we can tell Kate's story uh, again through the liquid, having her become a cultural conversation piece, bringing her into the present. And the fact that like the West is red hot right now, we see in like a multimedia expansion, entertainment, fashion, food, like the West, you know, everybody wants to talk about the West. And so, I mean, I think there is a world now how to capitalize that, you know, we're still running this business like entrepreneurs where we fundraise and we sell product. And so that's, that's our AR and AP cycle. The dream for me is as simple as Kate becoming one of the guys. I mean, I hate kind of saying that, but like, if I look at a back bar, I just want to be like Jack, Jim, Johnny, Kate, like, that's it. That's just the lineup. Jack, Jim, Johnny, Kate, if you're going to have your standards, those should be the standards. Um, and so I do think there's a world there's, there's definitely world. There's so much time. Like we are building something valuable. Um, with the product and with her story. So hopefully there is a world where, you know, again, the story grows and takes on its a new life form. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for sharing your story and Kate's story. And 
thank you to Kate. Uh, this is, yeah, this is, uh, you know, an amazing story. And I think this is hopefully, uh, this is just part of getting that, you know, getting her story and your story out there. So thank you so much and cheers. Yeah. Cheers, Sean. Thanks. Thank you.